first, we are joined by Reg Spencer, the Head of Research for Canaccord. He'll be providing an overview of the lithium sector. Good morning, Reg. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I'll be uh, providing uh, a uh, outlook uh, for the lithium market uh, based on um, the research that we have done here at Canaccord. Uh, I'll just uh, pass through the uh, disclosures, which you can see there. As an introduction to the current state of play in the lithium market, there's no doubt uh, the pricing has been volatile, as you can see on this chart here, which shows various lithium product prices dating back to 2018. Clearly, uh, this uh, recent price performance is characterised by the sharp spike in prices that we witnessed at the back end of 2021. Um, uh, followed by, uh, a, a, I guess, a, a sharp fall or pullback in prices uh, through the early part of 2023 uh, as the market uh, dealt through uh, stock uh, inventories in, in the system and some uh, evidence of slower uh, demand growth. But um, in spite of that volatility, we remain bullish on the outlook for lithium. If we can start with demand uh, and the key driver of that being uh, EV sales, as we can see on this chart here, EV sales continue to grow and demonstrate strong, uh, strong uh, per growth performance. So far in 2023, uh, there's been just over 7 million uh, EVs sold around the world. That's uh, plus 42% versus uh, the same time last year. And within that, uh, China does remain the primary driver of that sales growth with around 56% global market share. Now, so far year to date, um, the market does appear to be on track to meet uh, ours and the market's expectations in terms of to total EV sales through the year. Um, it's worth highlighting that uh, sales growth or, or, or EV sales throughout the year uh, have shown quite a distinct seasonal pattern, i.e. the second half is always stronger than the first half. So with first half sales arguably around that 6 million unit mark, we should see um, uh, full year sales uh, achieve that 13 to 14 million uh, number and, and continue to drive uh, reasonable lithium demand growth. Now, if we think about longer term outlook, um, we are very optimistic on the long term prospects for on ongoing EV penetration. By 2030, we think global uh, car sales uh, or half of global car sales will be covered by electric vehicles. Um, we would also uh, highlight that uh, that outlook is supported not only by industry targets or, or auto OEM electrification targets, but also by government legislations with numerous countries around the world uh, looking at uh, uh, having either legislated or looking at legislating um, minimum electrification targets or the banning of uh, ICE cells uh, outright. I'd also highlight um, one other part of the demand market or the demand side that not a lot of uh, people seem to be talking about is stationary storage applications. Uh, this is uh, either behind the meter, this is industrial or good scale battery storage. It's a key component of uh, the ongoing rollout of both solar and, and wind energy as part of the renewable market. Um, and uh, we are now starting to witness some pretty strong growth in that market segment. So all up by 2030, we think uh, demand is going to continue to grow at over 20% per annum uh, and hit about 3 million tonnes of LCE by 2030, um, and noting also the potential for some upside to our forecasts uh, through uh, larger EV batteries, um, faster EV sales growth or stationary storage batteries. Now, what if I told you that um, looking at demand uh, from that perspective uh, could be undercutting uh, the market? Uh, in our view, battery manufacturers do have better visibility into future demand. And as such, we think that battery factory capacity could be a more reliable indicator of future demand. Um, total uh, battery factory capacity is now estimated to be around seven terawatt hours by 2030. Now at 100% utilisation, this could imply that overall lithium demand could uh, exceed 7 million tonnes of LCE by 2030. Now that's a little bit optimistic, noting that uh, battery factories uh, often have uh, ramp ups, they often have a high scrap rate. Um, and if we just assume that at utilisation rates for those factories were only 55%, that would imply a lithium demand of around 4.5 million tonnes in 2030 which represents uh, over 50% higher or, or an increase on our base case. So on that note, um, we think that there is a lot of upside to demand forecasts in the market and perhaps uh, EV based methodologies such as what you see from industry and, and brokers and banks such as ourselves um, could be a little bit conservative. Now, all this said, um, demand growth forecasts are predicated on adequate supply. You can't uh, sell an EV if you don't have the lithium to, to make your batteries. 
So the supply side of the equation is just as important as demand in our view. If we have a look at what's happening in 2023, uh, we continue to expect this year to be a significant supply growth year. In fact, we we estimate that this year will be about a 50% increase in supply relative to 2022. And that's a result of a number of delayed uh, greenfield and expansion projects that were hit by COVID uh, through that uh, 2020, 2021 and 2022 periods. If we break down this uh, forecast supply growth, um, greenfield projects are expected to play a, a major part of this. Uh, we see them as critical to the long-term supply outlook. And if you have a look at the chart on the bottom of this slide here, you can see that approximately 50% of our model 2030 capacity comes from greenfield projects. Now, the implication for this is greenfield projects typically carry, carry higher permitting, financial and technical risks. Um, and uh, it's on that basis that we, we have to take with a grain of salt the ability for the supply side to keep pace with demand. Uh, and uh, that does draw into question uh, what happens uh, for long-term pricing outlooks. Another way of looking at long-term supply, uh, this, is a, this chart is a little bit busy, but it basically represents uh, all the lithium projects that have come online in the last couple of years and, and the projects that we expect to come online in the next few years. Uh, but basically what we're showing here is that on average, lithium projects are late by approximately three years. The black represents when they were originally meant to come online, the dark blue represents the delay, and the, the dark gray represents steady state production. Um, in some cases, that delay has been up to 10 years. So while uh, we uh, see a, a supply pipeline that's starting to build out, we're seeing new discoveries being made, we're seeing new projects be brought into production, um, it's worth uh, being a little bit more cynical about that supply growth noting the propensity and the poor track record of the industry to bring in uh, new suppliers planned. Another factor that we think could limit the market supply response is that uh, inflationary pressures uh, continue to drive up capital costs. Uh, we think that uh, average industry capital intensities have increased by approximately 20% over the last 12 months and are now sitting at somewhere around that $25,000 a tonne mark. So if we take that uh, average capital intensity and multiply that out by the amount of supply that we, the market will need by 2030, um, we see an industry that requires uh, almost 60 billion US dollars in capital uh, to be spent in order for supply to keep pace with demand. Now, uh, it's not easy for an industry to spend that kind of money uh, quickly. And the noting that the lead times for new supply can be anywhere uh, as we've shown on that previous slide from uh, say three to five years, we need to have spent this, this kind of money by 2027 in order for uh, supply to keep pace with a 2030 demand number. So in our view, uh, it's almost too late for supply to keep pace with demand. Uh, and we think that's gonna have uh, uh, major implications for how investors and how the industry thinks about long-term pricing scenarios. So when we throw uh, supply over, over the top of our demand forecast, we come up with this curve. Um, as you can see here, uh, we expect that major market deficit that we witnessed last year uh, to somewhat reverse in 2023. We expect the market to remain uh, closely, well, more or less in balance over the next couple of years before we start to see market deficits emerge again by 2025 and really start to open up by the, the back end of the decade. The following slide here um, breaks down that supply demand or that market balance in a little bit more detail. You'll see here um, that, that the market we see to still remain in undersupply, but, um, but not uh, the same kind of deficits that we've seen in the last few years. Again, before we start to see those, uh, that deficit open up in the back half of the decade. Um, the potential for us to be wrong on these forecasts is twofold. Number one, if we continue to overestimate supply, like uh, what we think the market has done for the last five years, um, could lead to much higher deficits than what we've forecast. And similarly, if demand continues to grow a lot stronger than what we've forecast here, um, these uh, deficits will be a lot higher than what we've forecast. And again, I'll point you to uh, that slide that we uh, mentioned earlier, uh, referencing uh, the impact that uh, battery uh, factory capacity could have on demand if, if we thought uh, that that was the, the primary way to uh, forecast that part of the market. Um, again, if we have a look at batteries uh, on the demand side, you've got clearly EVs are going to be the strongest part of the market or the largest part of the market, I should say. But other batteries, including consumer products and uh, ESS or stationary storage, um, 
that could be a part of the market that uh, grows a lot stronger than what we forecast here. Again, uh, potentially pointing to much larger deficits than what we've uh, shown in that red hatch box there. So the outlook for pricing. Um, Clearly, uh, with the market moving back into balance uh, or, or much smaller deficits, at least we don't expect the pricing that we saw in the back half of 2022 uh, to be able to be sustained. And frankly, in our view, that kind of pricing environment was not sustainable for the industry, given the impact that it has on the cost of batteries and the impact that it would have on the sticker price of an electric vehicle. Um, so we expect pricing to, uh, to continue to settle um, and settle around current levels. Uh, our long-term forecast, as you can see here, have uh, chemical pricing settling around that thirty to forty thousand dollar a ton mark, and long-term spodumene settling around that two and a half thousand dollar a ton mark. Uh, to put that number into context, we we need to measure that up against where pricing was prior to that, which you can see here. You're looking at two or three times spodumene or two or three times lithium hydroxide or carbonate, where we expect pricing to settle. Uh, but the other way to think about that is to have a look at the implied price that the equities are suggesting, um, which is about half of, of where we think prices will be in the long term. So on that basis, um, uh, we see uh, we see good potential uh, for uh, equities in this pricing environment. But not only that, um, I draw your attention back to these market deficits that we uh, forecast in the latter part of this decade. Uh, which could also suggest that our long-term pricing assumptions are probably a little bit too conservative. Um, a key theme in the market we see is, is a continuation of uh, M&A activity. Uh, this table here shows a selection of uh, recent M&A or sector consolidation transactions. You, what you'll notice uh, is that there is a distinct trend for the valuation uh, or implied valuation of these M&A uh, transactions to start to increase. Uh, we're also starting to see rejections of, of uh, M&A bids, which would suggest that uh, either industry or investors are starting to recognise the long-term strategic value of lithium assets um, and that uh, the strategic players or downstream players that are looking at moving upstream are probably going to have to uh, uh, increase uh, their perception of value in order to secure these assets uh, uh, over the long run. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll finish off with what we see as the key themes in the lithium sector. Um, if we're having a, a think about the kind of investment or the kind of companies and the kind of stocks uh, that one, an investor might look at, you look at producers versus developers and explorers. Um, lithium producer stocks uh, we, we see as maybe witness to increased volatility given correlation to lithium prices. Uh, but we see valuations uh, remaining attractive uh, over the long run compared to spot pricing. Uh, the developers, those companies that are developing lithium projects today, uh, we, we consider those to be perhaps more exposed to financing and commissioning and ramp up risks. Um, and conversely, uh, explorers, uh, in our view, uh, are, are starting to offer increased appeal in the current environment, given that they're not necessarily uh, that exposed to uh, volatile lithium prices. And you do uh, you have the potential for significant value uplift on a new discovery or resource definition. And there's a numerous examples of that in the Australian market uh, of, of explorers that have done well in recent times. Um, another theme uh, that we see is dominating the sector is uh, emerging lithium hotspots around the world. It's not just Australia. We are starting to see the rise of Canada uh, as an emerging jurisdiction. You're on the doorstep of the world's second largest auto market there. Uh, compared to Australia, it is significantly underexplored. Um, and through that, we see excellent potential for continued discovery. Uh, and you've got strong ESG credentials there, given um, the high proportion of renewable energy uh, and, and proximity to end markets that Canada has. Uh, another emerging jurisdiction we see is Brazil. Um, and uh, we do see some pretty exciting potential there. Uh, geologically, very prospective relatively underexplored today versus in Australia. It's an established mining jurisdiction. And unlike Australia, is a lower operating cost environment. You can get things done relatively quickly in Brazil. And uh, there are a number of emerging stories that we see uh, in that country that, that could have the potential to do well over the near term. Lastly, would also mention Africa. Um, uh, while that has high country risk, uh, proximity to key end markets such as Europe and, and the Atlantic Basin, plus its geological potential should continue to see uh, new development and production opportunities arise over time there as well. Uh, we've spoken about M&A and then lastly, geopolitics. Uh, 
we see that continuing to have a, an influence on what happens in the lithium sector, heat producing nations such as Chile. Um, we've seen what's happened there. We've got a government that's moving to the left, um, uh, which could potentially disrupt uh, that country's ability to continue to uh, grow its, its production base. Argentina, there's an election there later this year. Potentially, we see politics move to the right. Um, and that could see Argentina's role in the lithium supply equation increase uh, over the next little while, especially given the large number of development projects in the country, as well as China, um, uh, given the, uh, the, the politics involved with and, and China's concentration and control over critical mineral markets and the West's desire to uh, increase their independence from their control. Um, where does China go for asset opportunities? It really does limit them to say regions like South America and Africa uh, in, in the case of mergers and acquisitions. So Jane, uh, that's probably it from me. I know that's a, a lot of ground to cover in a, a relatively short period of time, uh, but hopefully that's been useful for everyone. And uh, if anyone's got any questions, happy, happy to take them. Wonderful. Thank you, Reg, for the great presentation. Um, we've run slightly over time, but I think one of the key things is, you know, tell us about some of the new producers that will be coming online in the near term. So who are Canacod looking at? Um, well, there's a few of them now. Uh, look, if we get beyond the Pilbaras and the Orchems and the IGOs in the, in the markets, uh, we're starting to see a new crop come through. Companies like Liontown that are moving through their development and construction companies like Leo Lithium, who are partway through construction of their project in Africa. Uh, but you've also got companies that have recently moved into production, such as Core Lithium in the Northern Territory uh, and uh, Canadian uh, focused Sayona Mining, which has recently just commissioned or recommissioned a project in Quebec. Uh, they're the kinds of things that we're focusing on. Um, but if you have a look on a two to three year period, you're probably going to, that, that, that peer group is probably going to increase dramatically. And there's a, a whole raft of companies that we see have considerable de development potential and, and hopefully fill, go some way to filling that supply gap. Amazing. Well, Reg, thanks again for the great presentation and a copy of today's recording will be available online in the coming days. But thanks again. Thanks, Jane.